Good morning, everyone. Caitlin here from Enso Theater Ensemble. And for today's Daily Mindfulness, something a little bit different, I am going to be interviewing positive psychologist and extraordinary human being, Ashley Odell, who also happens to be my cousin. And today we're going to talk a little bit about tips for maintaining and improving mental health during quarantine. <laughs> like introducing yourself and just like tell us like who you are and what you do yeah so um i am uh so my background is in counseling and i have a career specialization so i work with people and their career development um and i've done that for years but um i got really interested in positive psychology and went and got a certificate in applied positive psychology um, from the flourishing center which is a big organization that's focused on this and uh then went ahead and started my own business focused in this field and if you're interested you can always go check out my website at ashleyroseodell.com so i'm really trying to you know make the world a better place honestly through developing um, people's knowledge of what actually creates happiness yeah that's incredible i know you and i have had really good conversations about sort of the intersection of mindfulness and stuff that you do which yeah. is awesome because and I mean, that, I think that's sort of why I wanted to talk to you about, um, like, just the circumstances that we're in right now, I think, warrant a little bit of attention and care to our mental state. Um, and so to sort of get us on the right path, can you talk a little bit about what exactly, like, when you say positive psychology, yeah. what does that mean? What is that? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so positive psychology, put very simply, is the science of happiness. Um, so everybody's pretty much familiar with traditional psychology, and the idea behind traditional psychology is typically, okay, what is wrong with you, um, and trying to fix that. Positive psychology is looking at what is right with you. So basically, it's really trying to look at what, what makes life worth living, um, what creates uh, meaning for people, what helps people find uh, a life that is engaging and connected, um, and it's really strength-based, and it's looking at what's what's right with the individual and building on that. Yeah, I love that. I one of the things that I think of when I hear like when I hear positive psychology is that. Uh, uh, like associating it with the word positive in some cases makes me think like, oh, so we're going to be happy all yeah. of the time, like 24 seven happiness, right. which, which is interesting. I have a really interesting reaction to that. I feel like to some extent it actually sort of stresses me out and I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> if I'm supposed to be happy all the time, like I don't even know if I can picture myself in a state where I'm happy all the time. So can you speak to that? Um, like that reading of it and if if sort of perpetual happiness isn't the goal of positive psychology then what would you say I mean you kind of spoke about it a little bit but can you say sort of like like just respond to that a little bit yeah and and I think that that your reaction to it is very common actually I think that positive psychology and the sort of positivity movement um, are often kind of um, mush together in people's minds but it's really that's that's their distinct right the um the goal of positive psychology is not to make you happy all the time that's inhuman right part of being yeah. human is having negative emotions and that's right. to deny that is actually very damaging to people they've uh, a lot of studies have shown that meta emotions which are your emotions about your emotions are actually more damaging than emotion Themselves. So in other words, if you're angry or unhappy and you go, I shouldn't be angry, I should not be unhappy, I should be happy, um, that actually hurts you more than the original unhappiness of original anger. And it's better to acknowledge and, you know, allow those emotions because that's part of being human, right? There is no happiness without a happiness. These things are normal um, and we should feel okay about that. So positive psychology by no means denies negative emotion. Um, 
you know, positive emotions are something to be cultivated and that is part of it. Um, but that's only one part of it. So, um, when folks talk about positive psychology, they often refer to the PERMA V model. So that's P E R M A V. Um, and this is, um, you know, sort of all the components of positive psychology, because obviously there's a lot of research in a lot of different areas. And P is positive emotion, right? So P refers to things like, uh, you know, mindset and resilience, optimism, um, you know, so sort of these ways of thinking and ways of seeing the world. But there are many other parts to it, right? There's engagement, which is, you know, um, being uh, connected to activities that you're doing. Um, there's, uh, and mindfulness and things like that. There's, um, you know, relationships is a huge part of that. I'm going to talk a little bit about that later, probably. Um, meaning, which is finding something larger than yourself to work on or to work towards, um, and spirituality and other things like that. Um, transcendence, awe, experiencing this, you know, feeling of amazement when you see beautiful nature or something like that. Then you have, uh, achievement, which, you know, is goal setting and kind of working towards something that is is meaningful, right? Um, persevering, things like that. And finally, um, vitality, which is related to your physical health um, and mental health. And so this is you know, it's very hard to apply some of these other pos uh, positive psychology components if you're unhealthy. So it's sleep and nutrition, because it's all connected, right? So as you can see, the positive emotions are only one part of it. So no, you don't have to be happy all the time. Um, Phew. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's not the goal. So, so to answer your question about what is the goal, um, the basic goal is to promote, promote meaningful, satisfactory life, right? So satisfactory life doesn't necessarily mean you're happy all the time. It means that you can look at your life and say, yes, I feel like this is a good life, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the actually to live a satisfactory life, you often have to experience discomfort or negative emotion. So if you're pursuing a goal of, let's say, starting a business, right, there inherently is going to be difficult emotions or discomfort involved in that, but that's worth it because that's all about resilience and persistence and, um, you know, engagement in the work. And it's not always these happy, joy, pleasure feelings, but it's worthwhile work, right? So yeah. another example I like to use is people have children, right? Um, they've done studies showing that people who have children are less happy than people who don't. But, um, you know, if they also have done studies where people act, ask about life satisfaction and meaning and people who have children tend to have higher levels of meaning and overall life satisfaction. Oh, interesting. So, yeah, so it's hard to have kids, right? It's yeah. hard. The day-to-day isn't maybe as pleasurable, right? Because you have to deal with a screaming child or diapers or whatever else. Yeah. Um, but you gain a lot of satisfaction from it because you're working on something that is meaningful and greater than yourself. So I think that's a per perfect example of, um, you know, this misconception being kind of looked at in a, in a practical way, right? That overall you look back on your life and say yes this is a good life or you can even stop and say am i living a good life yes i am maybe i'm not happy joy all the time but but i'm doing something that means something to me and there's actually a lot of studies to support this idea um i think one of the best ones was put together by martin seligman and he is one of the you know the godfather of positive psychology right. um, and uh, he um, looked at uh, basically ways of living so that's kind of how they refer to the, to the study and the ways of living study um, looked at people who are living what they call the pleasurable life so that's people are in a beautiful home and get a lot of vacations and go to parties and you know experience a lot of pleasures right um, which I think in our culture, that's what we think is happiness, right? We think right. of the pursuit of happiness as pursuing pleasure, right? Whether that be products or vacations or experiences, all of those things. Um, and then he looked at a couple other ways of living. One he called the good life. So the good life is that you do activities where you're fully engaged. So this is 
um, you know, hobbies or work where you can kind of lose yourself in your work. And the example I like to use, um, and since you're gonna, I, I, you know, I know you're a, um, a Parks and Rec fan. Um, oh, the example yes, I like, bring it. Yeah. Yeah, the example I like to use is Ron Swanson. Um, and for those of you who don't know that show, Ron Swanson is not the most joyful man. Um, he is a bit of a grumpy guy, actually. Um, but he loves certain activities that he does. So he plays the saxophone as Duke Silver. He has kind of yes. an alter ego. Um, he plays the saxophone. He builds furniture. He fixes things. And he gets this this engagement, right? He really gets into these activities that he does and, and that's engagement, right? Or uh, the other example I like to use is uh, if you ever watch Yo-Yo Ma play music, he's just completely uh, engaged in it. I mean, yeah. he's, he's lost some, I mean, you can just tell by looking at his face. Yeah. So that's, that's engagement. Um, and then, or the good life. And then Seligman looked at the meaningful life, which is doing something larger than yourself. Mm -hmm. So the meaningful life examples of that might be um, working for Greenpeace, right? Obviously not very pleasurable all the time. They're often going into very uncomfortable situations to try and make a difference, but they're working towards something greater than themselves or, you know, um, people who go to um, do doctors without borders, right? very uncomfortable, not pleasurable, but it, meaning, right? You're working towards a greater good, a greater cause. So what Seligman's studies showed was that if the meaningful life and the, uh, the good life, right, the engagement and working towards something greater than yourself were not fulfilled, the pleasurable life, the pleasures had no impact on your life satisfaction whatsoever. Hmm. So they only enhanced your life if you made sure that you also had meaning and engagement in your life. Right. So I think that that illustrates that idea of we all think we want joy and pleasure all the time, but actually what we really want as human beings is meaning and engagement. Um, and that's a big part of what psychology or positive psychology is looking at is not just happy, happy joy, although they do address that. Yes. Yeah how do we create a life worth living? That makes me think of the, another Parks and Rec reference, that makes me think of the treat yourself. Three words for you, treat yourself. Treat yourself 2011. Yeah. I love, and yeah. I, like I'm obsessed with that show. Leslie Nope is my spirit animal. <laughs> um, so, but I think that the, the, treat yourself sequences where the character, you know, there are characters that are like once a year, we just, we just buy ourselves any sort of self care pampering thing that we desire on that one day. And I think that there's an interesting distinction between sort of that pampering what you call the pleasure life, right. And, um, and self care, which I think, for me, they're different. And I think that the way that self-care, you were talking about media representation. I think sometimes the way that self-care gets represented in the media is like, oh, just go buy yourself that facial. Like, yeah. go do that. That'll feel good. Um, and what I've noticed for myself is like, sometimes if I go do that thing, like, I'm like, I just want, like, I'll just, I'll just do it. I'll just buy it. Um, sometimes I actually, then there's a weird cycle that starts with like, I bought it and I'm really low on cash right now. And now I feel guilty for buying this thing. And like, and so ultimately this thing that was supposed to make me feel better actually ends up generating more, um, anxiety for myself. Yeah. So I, I love that you said that, um, that, uh, uh, the thing that we find the most satisfaction from right is the is things with meaning right or things with what was the other you used another word the good so life. engagement the life. yeah the good life it's engagement right yeah yeah and that that i think ties beautifully into um my understanding at least of mindfulness which is that the goal of mindfulness practice is not to generate joy right and and you see these images of like 
uh, you know, beautiful women on the beach, like meditating and just like, ah, I'm so calm. (laughs) When in fact, most of most, like the majority of my mindfulness sessions are not calm. They're incredibly uncomfortable. I don't want to do them. I don't want to show up for them. No, no. Right. Because you're practicing awareness and in generating awareness of your internal state, you're like, Oh God, look at all this just blah, stuff inside me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I love the distinction that like self-care can be taking yourself out to a facial because you've been working for 24 seven for the last week. And what you need is that kind of pampering. Right. But it's not exclusively that. And, and, and generating self-awareness around what you actually need versus the thing that you want versus sort of like the pleasurable desire. Right. Um, I, and being able to identify that is really important. Um, yeah. I think that your example, um, like there's a couple of things I wanted to comment on there. Um, your example of the, uh, you know, the parks and rec version of self-care is what we, as you kind of alluded to, is what we've been sold by the media, right? By advertisers. I mean, yeah. if you look at advertisement, it's, it, you know, and it's obviously this is the whole point is to get you to buy something, but it says, if you buy this, you'll be happy. Right. Um, right. And, and, you know, the treat yourself, but it's also like, you know, uh, you know, take a break today with Kit Kat and um, you deserve it with some, I think, you know, cosmetic line or something. It's all of that. Right. And so we've been told that, and that's really a capitalist definition of self-care, right? Mm. Um, and and really what you describe, that feeling of, um, you know, maybe you get a momentary spurt of joy from that thing that you bought. Um, and, you know, some of us also experience guilt because you spent money on it. So that's another piece. But there's something um, that's been widely studied that's called the hedonic adaptation or the hedonic mm-hmm. treadmill it's sometimes called where it's basically if you buy something yes you are going to get a momentary spurt of pleasure but the problem is is we adapt to that so um you know i think the perfect example is cell phones right so you get the newest cell phone you feel really good about it for a little while and then you adapt to it and you kind of forget about it and then you start looking at the next version of that cell phone and then you feel that you don't have what you want, you feel a sense of um, discomfort or dissatisfaction with that fact. And then that makes you unhappy. So you go out and buy the next version and then that makes you unhappy and then you buy the next version, right? So thinking happiness through um, material goods is not going to work right um and you know you add into that comparing yourself to other people and it's just a a horrible cycle right so that treat yourself um although hilarious um and you know there's nothing inherently wrong with occasionally buying yourself a little something but yeah i I completely agree right yeah right yeah. Right. But if you think that that's going to make you happy or if that's what self-care is, that you're going to be disappointed. So I think, um, you know, if, if I can weigh in a little bit on how I kind of see self-care, yeah. um, you know, I, I'd say, of course, there's a sort of basic wellness components, obviously, because it's really, really hard to be happy if you are unwell, right? If you're eating, you know, I don't know, chips for all your meals, you just can't really feel good right um so there's the basic wellness components like make sure you exercise it releases a bunch of endorphins it's really really good for you make sure you eat well and you know if you are doing stress reduction techniques and mindfulness can be one of those um even though that's not always comfortable and i'm going to comment on that um but i think some other things that people don't think about very often when they think about uh, self-care is things like self-compassion um, and sort of dealing with judgment. Um, so self-compassion being that we tend to be the meanest people to ourselves, right? Um, things that we would never say to a friend we say to ourselves. And um, that is damaging, right? Um, and so there's a lot of research on self-compassion. If 
you know, the watchers are interested, uh, check out Kristen Neff's TED Talk. Oh my God, um, she's amazing. She's amazing. And she has a great website with meditations related to self-compassion. But basically the idea is that you are accepting yourself as you are. You are acknowledging your suffering, um, acknowledging that that's part of being human, kind of as I alluded to earlier, and that it actually connects you to other people. I think a lot of times when we feel unhappy, we feel like we're so alone, right? Because everybody else seems happy, right? But the, the fact is everybody's suffering, that's part of being human, you acknowledge that. And you acknowledge the suffering that comes from your own judgment. Yeah. And then you treat yourself, right? Treat yourself well, <laughs> right? Um, you know, some of the practices that Kristen Neff suggests are to actually, you know, put your hands on your chest and kind of pat yourself and say, you know, um, you know, this is really hard right now. You. Um, I'm so sorry you're going through this and you can say this out loud or you can say it in your head um, or you can say something just like you know I I you know I'm here for you right um, to yourself um, or you can hug yourself and I know it sounds corny but there's actually a lot of research behind first of all self-touch it releases you know touch releases all these good hormones and it makes you feel cared for um, even if you're doing this yourself um, and then the fact of that sort of changing your dialogue with yourself into something positive is really something that should be cultivated. And that's the best self-care because if you're going through something difficult, acknowledging the difficulty, allowing it to be an opportunity to connect with the rest of humanity and telling yourself that, Hey, I'm here for you. It's okay to feel this way is one of the best ways to care for yourself, especially during a difficult time. Um, and really kind of being mindful of judgment. I, I, I have a perfect example. My sister um, is having a hard time with the, um, you know, shelter in place and like everybody else is, but she's making it so much worse for herself because, you know, they're drinking a little more, a little bit more than they usually do. And they're eating a little bit more than they usually do. Well, like the rest of America, but right. like she's, yes. she's, judging herself for it. So that creates a lot of discomfort and unhappiness. And so, you know, I tried to guide her through like, Hey, you know, have a little compassion for yourself and self-compassion doesn't mean indulgence. So I, I, you know, using that example, I'm sort of towing the line of going into that area. You don't just say you can have whatever you want or do whatever you want, but you know, if you did something already and you're judging yourself for it, you can say, you know what, I'm only human. Um, you know, it's okay. And you try and treat yourself better about it. Um, but it doesn't mean like, you know, go eat 10 hamburgers. That's not, yeah, that's, that's okay. self-compassion. That's self yeah. the, uh, the last interview that I did was with Stephanie Selinger, who's a nutritionist. Yeah. Her big takeaway at the end of our whole interview was like, in terms of eating mindfully in quarantine, she was like, look, eat what you're craving. Just notice how you feel afterward. You know what I mean? And she was like, like, yeah, you're gonna comfort eat. Like, that's okay. It's okay. Yeah. We're going through trauma right now. We're going through a lot of stress. Like yeah. it's okay to to indulge in the things that are making you feel better. Right. But you pay attention to the effect, right? right? And do invite course correction. Right. If you notice that after consuming whatever you've eaten, that you're like, yeah. oh, I'm I'm not feeling so great now. Exactly. So I, I think a really, really simple way of helping you determine whether it's self-indulgence versus self-compassion yeah. is to say, what would a wise and kind friend say? Yeah. So a wise and kind friend wouldn't say, go eat 10 Big Macs. Right. Probably so, not. No, but a wise and kind <laughs> friend would say, oh, you ate, you ate one Big Mac? you know, everybody's comfort eating. It's okay. How do you feel? Oh, I don't feel so good. Well, maybe next time don't have a Big Mac, but maybe you could just have, you know, a couple of fries or something. You know, what would a wise and kind friend say? So Absolutely. you should talk to yourself like that, right? Um, so I think that that's one of the best ways of performing self-care. And, and, you know, I think um, one other really good way of performing self-care is care for others. Um, you know, for a lot of people, you know, we're a very individualistic society. Um, so we focus on ourselves. We have a, you know, million or billion dollar self-help industry. Um, you know, obviously when you purchase things, you purchase it generally for yourself. 
But um, the truth is that we actually become happier through helping others. Um, and so there's a really interesting study that was done where they wanted to determine if people were purposefully seeking happiness, um, whether that would actually make them happier. Mm. And so they did the study in the United States and in Britain, which are individualistic countries, right? And they did the study in Russia and a couple of Asian countries, which are more collectivistic. So in individualistic countries, just to give you an example, um, in a, a different study, they'd show an image of a little girl crying and then all the other kids around the little girl are, I'm sorry, the little, one little girl is happy and then all the other girl or kids around them are unhappy. And they would show this in an individualistic culture and say, is this little girl happy? And then the individualistic culture, they would say, yeah, she is. But in the collectivist cultures, despite the fact that the girl appeared happy, they would say, no, she's not, because how could she be happy if everybody else around her is unhappy, basically? So it's just a really different way of thinking of things. That's yeah. Really cool. So, the, yeah, yeah. So the study that I, I first started talking about where they were trying to determine, you know, whether um, actively seeking happiness would make you happier or not. Yeah. In the United States and London, no, it did not. In Russia and the Asian countries, yes, it did. And the sort of discussion surrounding this is the idea behind what happiness is is different because in collectivist countries, well, I, you know, happiness equals everybody being happy. Right. Um, in individualistic cultures, it's just me being happy. So I think part of self-care is to seek out opportunities to help other people. Because it actually does make you happy. Yeah. Um, so we tend to forget that. That word self is one, right? Um, but really helping other people will make you happier. So there are opportunities to do that, um, even in this crisis. Uh, and I think that that's a big part of self-care is actually care for others. Um, yeah. And, you know, so I was. I think, you know, we tend to forget that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm so glad you brought that up because I was just having a conversation with my husband about this exact thing the other day and sort of the inflow outflow of like taking time for yourself versus like expelling energy to help other people. And, um, yeah, and we were talking about how it's, uh, it's an, it's not a linear, it's not a linear thing, right? So it, it doesn't really work to go like, okay, this week is all about me. And then next week I will care for other people, right? Like, so I love, I love the reminder that self-care is not just about hiding yourself in a hole, right? And sort of like yep. making sure that you are all in one piece, that it, it, it requires outward focus. And part yeah. of that for me is that if I get stuck in my head for too long, like worrying about like, why am I thinking this? Well, now why am I thinking this? Right. I'm anxious about X, Y, Z. If I'm in there too long, it's, it becomes self-destructive, right? So in the process, yeah. right? In the process of trying to be like, oh no, like I need to fix what's happening inside. I'm like just hurting myself. Uh, I love, by the way, I love so much that like my experience of this is sort of like very experiential and just like sitting and then you're like, yes, science can prove this. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, makes, I mean, that's what makes it real. If you yeah, have right. Goals, and I mean, this is one of the reasons that I love this field so much because, yeah. you know, I also have these experience going, oh yeah, I judge myself and that's the worst thing. Or if I argue with my emotions, that's the worst thing. Or if I spend too much time in my head, that's the worst thing. So like right. all of these things, it's beautiful to have your examples and how they connect to the data, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. Absolutely. I think um, your point is really interesting. And I just want to bring up another example of this like balance of making sure you're okay before you help other people i think um and and you said it's not linear right and and i think that that's a really important point because i think sometimes um we go okay well i have to fix myself before i can help other people mm -hmm. and i am certainly guilty of this um and 
there's actually been some work done and, and there aren't as many studies to support this, um, but there's some interesting sort of pioneers in um, treating people with severe mental health issues like severe depression, severe anxiety, and, and some other issues where they, they actually do what's called, um, oh man, I, it's like prescriptive social engagement or something like that, but they basically prescribe people to go out and do community service. So, um, you know, this is combined with individual therapy, yeah. but they found that the work out in the community, they, they just hook up with a bunch of volunteer organizations and offer, you know, the patients a list of things. So they pick something that, you know, means something to them. Um, they found that that was so much more impactful than just having individual therapy. So it's actually can be part of the treatment when people are feeling poor, um, that, they go do service for other people. And, and, you know, there are certainly distinctions to be made, right? Sometimes there are people that lean on you, um, that make it so it, it, you know, you can't care for yourself or it, or it isn't self care. Right. Um, right. but these opportunities for providing service to others actually help these people with severe mental health dis uh, disorders. And it wasn't like they needed to get therapy before they did that. They, that was the therapy. Right. So I think I think that's it's really interesting because it's so intertwined and, and and they didn't throw the therapy out, right? That was also part of it was this sort of individual work that they had to do. They had to be um, you know, going out and doing service, but also being working on what was going on with them. So it's it's I think more complicated than we we tend to think, right? We tend to think linearly, but that's not really, you know, accurate. So anyway, I just think anything, anything yeah. actually functions or happens in the world. No, yeah. we want it to, but it doesn't. <laughs> so yeah, I think it was just a, a really great illustration of sort of the point that you were making. Um, right. And it's just an interesting way to think about things differently. Yeah, I love that. I, yeah, I, I think that's, I think that's absolutely accurate. Um, and I think that, uh, so from like an artistic perspective, right, one thing that Enso Theater is doing is trying to incorporate mindfulness in the rehearsal room. And part of, part of that, Part of the reason for that is because when you show up to a rehearsal room, literally the, the ask is all at outward energy, right? The ask is like all focusing on your scene partner. It's like completely trying to connect to the other people in the room and expelling this big thing outward while inwardly you are generating like real emotions and real chemical reactions. And your body doesn't necessarily know the difference between like, oh, these are just for pretend and like, oh, no, 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 but these are for real, right? And I should pay attention to those. And so part of, part of having the awareness of the sort of nonlinear nature of taking care of yourself is that, is that I, I, I want to create a process that actors can begin to have that self-awareness while they're, while they're expelling outwardly and need to as part of their job, right? That they are able like in between scenes or during their five minute break to just like go check in and go, okay, where am I at? Like how far can I actually push today? Or do I need to lean back on technique a little bit, right? Can I actually dive deeper into that emotional work? Or do I just need to lean on like, you know, the technical aspects that I know as an actor will present well today because of where I am emotionally vulnerable at this particular moment. Um, so that's incredible. Do you mind if we like turn tables to talk about quarantine for a second? Let's do it. Let's do it. That's what we're all thinking Let's, about right now since it's been extended. Yes, <laughs> diving in there going in full hog. Yes. I know. Just to so, be clear, I support that, but it still sucks. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. No, we're all we're on the same page, right? Yeah. yeah definitely social distance, good thing. And yeah. also, oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, yes. Let let's let's focus on that. Yeah. So um let's have it, let's just start with like why <laughs> quarantine? Like the like why why in your with your beautiful knowledge base, do you think that the process of self-isolating, um, the process of social distancing may be generating stress and anxiety? Because I I I mean, I don't know about you. But my anxiety has definitely showed up <laughs> the last, however, the last 400 years that we've been in quarantine. Yeah. Yes. Um, 
So I, I was just kind of curious about like, before we dive into like tips, if there's anything we can understand around why these particular circumstances might be so hard on people. Well, I think that um, there's, you know, there's some obvious things and maybe some slightly less obvious things, or at least things that maybe people haven't thought about in, in more depth. I mean, first of all, of course, we are all in a position of a lot of fear and uncertainty. And that feeling of mastery over your own life is pretty important um, for happiness. And not feeling like you have mastery over your own life can create anxiety and stress and depression and things like that. So, I mean, when has there been a more, um, you know, uncertain sort of formula than there is now? I mean, not only do we not know what the virus is. We don't know how it impacts people. We're learning new things every day. Um, we don't know if we're going to get a vaccine. We don't know if we're going to get treatment. We don't know if Clorox is going to help us. Don't drink Clorox. Um, we don't know if, um, you know, uh, what the economy is going to do. We don't know if we're going to get our jobs back. I mean, it's, it's, it's very difficult because when we face adversity, um, it's easier to face adversity if you know what you're dealing with. So, if you know, okay, I lost my job for sure, and I'm definitely not getting it back. I know what to do. I know how to move forward. I can, I can, you know, plan. I can create goals. I can have some resilience, right? When you lose your job and you're like, well, I might get it back, but I might not. I don't know. I don't know how long this is going to last. I think that all of that creates a more difficult situation um, where we can't move past that trauma mm. because yeah. we don't really know what's happening. Um, so I think that that's a big part of it. But um, you alluded to this a little bit, but I, you know, obviously isolation is huge. So, I mean, there's been a multitude of studies about how important interaction is with other people. And it's not Unfortunately, as much as Zoom has been a huge boon um, to at least some basic interaction, it, it, the studies show that it actually um, takes eye contact, real eye contact um, or physical presence to have the sort of um, impact um, on both your mental and your physiological well-being. Um, we are obviously social creatures. We would not have survived if we were in tribes and we're biologically set up to seek out a group, right? To seek community. And if you're alone um, or, uh, you know, only in your small group and you don't have those interactions, it's stressful not only just because maybe you're feeling a little lonely, it's stressful because you're body is reacting to it. So, I mean, lonely people are more likely to die. I mean, I'm just going to start with the worst thing. Like your, your chance of death goes up if you're, if you're chronically lonely. Um, your chance of um, a variety of illnesses goes up. Your inflammation in your body can be measured um, very clearly if you're lonely. So all of these sort of physical symptoms are happening. And obviously uh, cortisol and all these other stress hormones are being released because what's your body biologically wants you to be with a group because, you know, and when we're hunter gatherers, it was safe, right? So yeah. just like you feel hunger, which is uncomfortable and, and stressful, right? You release stress hormones when you're hungry. Um, it's trying to get you to go eat or, you know, um, if you feel stress, it's trying to get you to run away from a, a tiger. Um, you feel all these bad things because your, your actual biology, your evolutionary setup as a human being is trying to get you to seek out other people because you're safe with other people. So we are fighting, right? We are uh, going against our very, very, very natural selves by being alone. And I would say that that's the biggest reason we're all feeling so bad and that the digital pieces don't really work. Um, I think there's another really interesting um, set of research by uh, Barbara Fredrickson. Um, she has a book called Love 2.0, which I would recommend. Um, and she looks at the idea that love is not just these sort of sustained interactions that you, know, you have with a partner or a family member. It's also these small interactions with strangers, um, just in your community and your day to day. 
and that if you do have, you know, real honest interactions with them, like, you know, you laugh with the checker at the grocery store or, you know, you look your barista in the eye and ask how their day is, yeah. these actually release the same sorts of, you know, um, happy, good feelings and have the same physical reactions on your body as, you know, some of your intimate relationships. Um, and it's really important, right? Because it's an extended community um, and we're missing all of those. So yeah. even if we aren't living alone, we're missing all of those micro, micro connections, right? These micro moments of love and positivity and, you know, happy joy in our body and our brain. Um, so I think that that's compounding it um, in addition to just the sort of general isolation. Um, so I think it makes sense that people feel bad. <laughs> Um, and you know, even if we're doing FaceTime or Zoom or whatever, just unfortunately doesn't do the same thing for us. It's better than nothing. It's better than nothing, but it doesn't do it. It's, I think that's so, I think it's so good to be reminded this, this may sound strange, but I think it's so good to be reminded of how abnormal the circumstances are. Um, because, uh, given the the certain degree of privilege that I have, right, where I'm in a home and I'm living with my partner and a roommate, um, and and generally speaking, like we can still get groceries and we're still okay and we're eating, we're eating okay. Um, it's there it's we we have noticed collectively, because we've talked about this as a household, that we have these moments where we're like, why am I reacting to this thing in this way? Do you know what I mean? Like we have moments where, where we can't figure out why, why everything feels strange or why like we're not responding to things in the way that we're accustomed to. And I think it's, it's a really good, it's a really good reminder to just go, yeah, this is not, this is not normal <laughs> and it's okay. Right. It's okay to be responding abnormally to yeah. an abnormal situation. Yeah. Um, and, and that your normal, or you're sort of like you're you're the way that you anticipate reacting to things or experiencing things is all going to change, right? It is, is all subject to change. Um, so okay, so with that sort of like heavy load on our shoulders now of like all the things that are that are making it hard to get up in the morning, um, how about some 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 tips or like practical things that folks can apply? when they feel, when they start to notice that they're having anxious thoughts. Um, and maybe you could speak to both like preventative tips and both like, and like when you're in the middle of your spiral or your panic yeah. attack. Yeah, I'd say pre preventative would be um, a variety of things. You, uh, and sometimes those can be used in the moment too. But um, I'd say that one, one big thing would be, you know, get as much connection as you can. Uh, even though it is digital for some people, you know, just do it. Um, and then, you know, people are going outside and just even seeing other people six feet away can make a difference. Um, yeah. you, know, you can still have a conversation with someone six feet away or farther if they decide it's farther. Um, you know, I mean, we chatted with our neighbor the other day and just stood really far away, but it, it helped. It was a micro moment, you know, that little that love 2.0. Um, yeah. I would say, you know, get out of your house um, and, and obviously follow all the regulations, be careful, but there's still opportunities for connection in your, in your neighborhood. And, and, you know, this is different for folks who might live in a rural, rural location or something like that, but um, I'm guessing most of the people that are watching your show are probably in, uh, or your videos are probably in an area where there are people um, out and about, but be safe, obviously. Um, I think another thing you can do is have flow experiences. So when I was talking about engagement, um, this actually, there's a whole book on engagement and how it impacts people. Um, if you're interested, it's called Flow uh, by Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi. So basically, a flow experience is an experience where um, you're doing something that has, you know, kind of clear goals, and um, it gives you immediate and clear feedback as to whether you're doing it right. And it takes sort of a, a equilibrium of skill and challenge. Um, so if it's too easy, you're not going to experience flow. If it's too hard, you're not going to experience flow. So um, what flow is, is this, this experience of losing yourself in an activity. 
So, um, you know, I'm, I'm guessing most folks have experienced flow at least a few times in their life. It's when you're doing something and you kind of lose track of time, um, you forget that you're hungry, you sort of become one with the activity. Um, and this is, as the researcher says, sort of the optimal human experience is this flow. And as, you know, when we talk about obviously the Martin Seligman ways of living research, it's crucial to having a, a satisfactory life, but it also really helps through moments like this, right? You're doing something that, that you forget about everything, that mind chatter turns off and experiencing, you know, uh, this kind of engagement allows you to feel really good, right? Um, and may make it so everything else is less impactful. Um, and this could be a, such a large variety of things. It's generally not things that are passive. So watching TV, no, even reading, um, you know, there's some argument about whether reading, exper you experience a flow state, I would say, um, maybe if it's more difficult literature, you might, but basically it, it's something that does require some skill. So it might be, you know, it could be knitting, it could be uh, yoga, it could be, um, you know, probably most people are rock climbing, but rock climbing, it could be, yeah. um, you know, a variety of things, uh, puzzles, those kinds of things. Um, so basically anything where you can get engaged and sort of lose yourself, um, and um, that will help. I also think that uh, gratitude can be helpful, and that can, again, it can be preventative, but it can also be something you dealt with in the moment um, if you're having a hard time. We tend to, we have, as a species, a negativity bias, which, again, helped us survive, right, because we're looking for the things that are going to hurt us. Yes. But now that we aren't living in the jungle, um, it's harder, right? So gratitude helps us with that negativity bias. And it also helps actually counteract the uh, hedonic treadmill. So if you have urges to Amazon shop, right, do a little gratitude practice. So um, sort of as a preventative measure, you might do gratitude journaling, which mm -hmm. um, is uh, basically, you know, as easy as writing down three things that you're grateful for every day and try and mix it up and try and expand on it more than just listing it, talk about why you're grateful for it. And this can be anything from, you know, I have clothes to wear to I have a wonderful life partner that I get to spend every day with during this quarantine to, you know, I have food on the table. So, you know, doing gratitude journaling in the moment, if you're feeling like, oh my God, this is the worst thing ever, you might just take a big deep breath and, and think of, what the positives are around you and you know it's a little trite it's like count your blessings but it actually research has shown that counting your blessings actually does have a strong impact on your well-being absolutely um yeah and then uh of course meditation i mean that's huge um and you know this is a big part mindfulness is a big part of, of your work um but it allows you to kind of be able to see those negative emotions to acknowledge them to think Hey, to kind of look at them is something maybe separate from yourself. So I kind of like it in one book I was reading, I like this image of when we have emotions, we tend to like they're in your face, right? And they're sort of all encompassing. Mindfulness allows you to look at the emotion as maybe not totally separate from yourself, but as a little bit removed, at least not right in your face, right? And I know this might sound odd to folks, but sometimes when I have these emotions, I'll actually envision myself holding it in my hands and looking at it and saying, hello, fear, um, you're here, you know, and just acknowledging it and saying, that's okay that you're here. And that is a mindfulness practice when we're having strong emotions that can be very helpful because sometimes, as you said, sitting down and meditating can be painful. Um, and that is part of meditation, right? It's a, it's like going to the gym, right? Um, <laughs> gym, the gym allows you to, uh, you know, do your day to day better, right? It allows you to pick up your groceries without straining. It allows you to get up the stairs without being winded and stuff. So we're, we're trying to make our whole day better, right? By going to the gym, sitting down and meditating is like going to the gym, right? <laughs> we are making it so our day to day, when we have these emotions, when we have these thoughts, we can look at them, not judge them let them go if they're not helpful for us um but for folks who don't feel like they can do the seated meditation even just that sort of in the moment practice can be helpful um of like looking at your emotion you know hold it in your hands or you might imagine it as like a ball in front of you or a, a color or something like that see it 
acknowledge it, don't judge it. It's okay that you're feeling that way. You might just say that to yourself and then, you know, let it go, but it might come back and that's okay, right? So don't judge yourself if it comes back. The, the point is not to, for it to go away. The point is to say, I am feeling this and to see it and to acknowledge it. And then finally, you know, I've already talked about self-compassion, but I think that that's really big. Um, we tend to judge ourselves for everything and uh, often our own emotions. So, you know, making sure that you're being kind to yourself, talking to yourself like a wise friend would talk to you, do that self-touch, you know, take a moment, check out some of Kristen Neff's uh, uh, meditation. She has a five minute self-compassion break. Um, so for those folks who might not have a regular meditation practice, that would be an easy one to integrate. Um, so I would say that those are all going to be helpful uh, in dealing with this crisis. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I, um, I love so much that you were doing this gesture because, yeah. um, if anybody's watched any of my, <laughs> my videos, I do a lot of like this, like, yeah. Oh, I see it. There it is. There's the thing that's, a yep. risen, you know, hi, yeah. hello, you know, creating yeah. that distance between you and the thing. Yep. Yeah. So we're doing a lot of whatever, yeah. whatever, whatever you want to hold it. That's all right. You hold it however you want. I, I love this one. I think um, one of the meditation, the reason I do that, and one of the meditations, oh no, it was uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, who I'm, you know, assuming you're familiar with. But oh, yes. Buddhist monk. He had, uh, that's how he sort of described it as like cherishing that, yeah. that emotion. Yeah. Like you don't yeah. want to cherish it. You're like, no, go away. Right. But it's just thinking about it in a really different way and sort of this like, Oh, I'll hold you yeah. like a little baby bird, you know, yeah. and cherish you. And I've heard other things where like you ask it to come in and sit down and say, what do you need? You mm -hmm. know? So, Oh, hello, anger. Take a seat. What can I help you with today? Like what yeah. do you need from me? So there are yeah. lots of ways, you know, and I think it was like images and ideas. Um, you can find something that works for you. I think they're very they're personal as to what works for yeah. you. Would you use? But um, yeah, I think, you know, this works this works yeah it works whatever is good for you in that moment yeah absolutely i i there's something about this that's very sort of nurturing yeah and i like that it it reminds me of um seeing the whatever your reaction is as sort of like your inner five-year-old yes right who's coming and like tugging on your sleeve and is like ah! like i'm experiencing all this stuff what do i do with it <laughs> and you're like hey like you wouldn't you wouldn't yell at a five-year-old you wouldn't say shut up yeah. stop go to your room right even though those are things that we say or metaphorically do do to ourselves right um so treating treating your treating your emotion and treating your reaction like it's this little kid that just like you know hasn't hasn't gotten enough to eat and is grumpy and is having a really hard day because the world is huge and scary and unknowable right now yeah. Yeah. right and just going like yeah it is unknowable right now <laughs> you yeah. can react that's right i love yeah. that i love that because you wouldn't talk to a five-year-old no. the way that you talk to yourself so i i think that's perfect yeah. that's a really great way to imagine it you can even imagine holding their hand or something you know right. I, I love that that's a great image and i think that yeah. those are so powerful we like stories and images as human beings and sometimes yes. mindfulness or meditation can feel very abstract yes so, uh, i think by developing these images it does it does really help um yeah. i'm yeah. not useful. i'm going to use that one <laughs> Yes, I feel like I've, I've heard it before, but I haven't really used it. You know, I, yeah. I think we're going to use that now. Thanks. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah. How about, um, so I think you, you spoke to this a little bit, maybe just very briefly, anyone that's completely isolated right now, like yeah. they live in an apartment and they don't have roommates, any tips for them who are yeah. just like, totally alone? Yeah. So, you know, you kind of heard obviously in the previous uh, response about, you know, go outside, um, and have those micro moments, those yeah. love 2.0 moments as much yeah. as you can in a safe manner. So obviously do that. Um, you know, use the digital means, uh, better than nothing. You know, I feel connection right now with you. Um, it's not the same and we can't yeah. get exhausted after zoom. There was an interesting article that came out that was talking about like, even our eyeballs are trying to connect and they can't. So it just tires us out, but it's still better than nothing. Um, but I have some ideas, some more specific ideas that 
for folks who are alone. Um, I think one thing you might want to do is take this as an opportunity to explore the relationships that you have in maybe a deeper way. Mm -hmm. So one practice that has been studied as a way of developing gratitude, but also it helps develop connection is to write gratitude letters. Um, so this is, you know, a letter, like actual written letter to somebody that, um, you know, has done something in your life, um, who's impacted you in some way, and you really explore that in detail, and you don't have to mail it, um, or email it, or whatever you choose, um, but the most impactful way of doing it, of course, is, um, and they did this in the study, is to go to their door and hand it to, hand it to them, excuse me, hand it to them, but obviously we can't do that in this instance, but the act of writing this, I think, um, basically supports the connection that you have with this person and helps you identify gratitude in your life and cultivate that, um, which is a very powerful emotion. Um, so that's one thing you can do. You could also, you know, write letters that maybe aren't gratitude letters that are just to sort of explore your relationship with somebody, um, whether you mail them or not. Um, and I think journaling also can be helpful for those people who are living alone because it's very true that our most important relationship, well, not our most important relationship, but a very, very important relationship in our life is with ourselves. So if you spend a little time sort of exploring what's going on with you and, um, you know, in whatever way you want to do that, I think that that can be really helpful as well. Um, yeah. And uh, you can look at, you know, some of the, the issues that you've been having, or you could just, you know, pick something in the room and just start writing about that and what, what memories it brings up. I mean, there's a variety of ways to go about it, but don't censor yourself. So when you think about an other reading it, it doesn't allow you to develop that um, relationship with yourself. So do it with, you know, no one is ever going to see this. Don't censor yourself. Don't go, oh, I sound stupid. Just write, which is why it's sometimes helpful to just like pick an object, start writing about it, and just go. And this yeah. also can create a flow state. So it's kind of doing yeah. multiple things, developing your relationship with yourself, flow state, et cetera. Um, and language is very powerful. The other thing I would say is look for opportunities for service. Um, you know, food banks need people. Um, you know, there have been people being really creative about it, just putting post-it notes on the next door neighbor saying, hey, you know, if you need anything, text me and then getting them groceries and putting it outside their door. So even if you're not having that interaction, um, or if it's a six feet away interaction, right. service is one of the best ways for you to feel a sense of community. Um, right. And it will help you develop happiness as well. So um, even if you're living alone, there's still lots of opportunities for you to go help people. Yeah. So that would be, I'd say, the number one spend time kind of figuring out how you can do that. And, um, you know, in your community, there should be resources um, to help you get connected with how to help. Um, but if not, if anybody wants to, I'm pretty good at finding these things from years of helping people find jobs. Um, so I'm happy to, to provide some, some help there if they can't find out a way to serve. Yeah, absolutely. I can I can attest to the at least the sort of the the bubbly sensation <laughs> that arises. A couple of weeks ago, I saw I came across this thing that was like you print out like a doorknob hanger that mm -hmm. had like, hey, if you need anything, like I live at such and such address just down the street, and like I'm happy to get you something. Yeah. And we printed out a bunch of those and we put them on our neighbor's doors. And I got the sweetest text from someone. I don't know who, but I got the sweetest text that was just like, you are a godsend and thank you so much. And like, yeah. I don't need anything, but like, thank you. And I was yeah. just like, yeah, yeah, yeah I did a thing. Yeah, and I have, um, this is sort of a tangent, but I think it's relevant. I have this hope um, from this experience that people will start to realize how impactful both community and service to others is. I mean, um, it's a little sad, uh, and this is one area that I'm really interested in, um, is that people have gotten more isolated over the last 40 years than they have been, um, and it just keeps getting worse and worse. And um, I mean, it's gone from, I think in the 1950s or maybe 40s or 50s, where people were, uh, were asked, you know, how many people do you have uh, to turn to if there was an emergency or uh, like how many people would be someone you would call if you're in the hospital and the number has gone down to uh, very very low 
um, you know, that like the majority of people said one or zero, um, whereas that did not used to be the case. Um, another sort of litmus test of our isolation is that, you know, community groups have dropped by over like 60 or 50 or 60 percent, and I'm sorry, I don't have the data right in front of me, but it's a huge number over the last 30 years. Um, so whereas people, for example, used to go to bowling leagues, now people just bowl, you know, alone or with their, like a couple of people. So these sort of community organizations have gone down. So my whole silver lining, right, um, for this crisis is that people realize how important community is, how important those micro connections are out in the day to day, and actually, you know, put down their phones and connect with people and look for opportunities to serve because of that bubbly feeling you talked about, right? And the sort of lack that everybody else is feeling, um, you know, when they're stuck in their houses. So that's my, my sort of Pollyanna way of looking at it is, well, maybe now people will realize because uh, there's, um, you know, thoughts and research and, and theories about the fact that our anxiety and depression epidemics and opioid epidemics, which is related to mental health, and um, you know, often obesity is related to mental health, are related to the isolation that we have, um, that people need other people and they're not getting that. And we are anxious and depressed as a result because biologically speaking, we need other people. So my hope is that people start to realize that and maybe, maybe, maybe things will get better after this. I don't know. Yeah, so. absolutely. I, I think hope is a really important thing to hold on to right now. Yes, it is. And that is a, another thing in positive psychology that they talk about, <laughs> which yeah. I, I don't have any studies off the top of my head for that one. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is perfectly okay. That was beautiful. I love that. Um, okay, so I think let's, let's start to wrap up. I have sort of a fun question for you. Yeah. Um, what I want to know is if you were going to do like an all day retreat, in your house because you are in your house right now. <laughs> what would that, what would your retreat look like? Like, how would you shape that? What kinds of things would you do? How would you get ready for it? What would you do? Oh man. Um, so I think it would look like a combination of, um, maybe like a self therapy and meditation and yoga studio. <laughs> nice. So I would probably spend, I mean, in terms of, I don't know, timeline wise, but I would certainly spend some time um, doing some reflection. I've been really, I've actually been quite busy, but I've been wanting to, to do some writing and to kind of reflect on myself. So I would do some of that, some journaling. Um, I, I found that yoga has been very helpful because it has a sort of combination of mindfulness, but also that body movement and, you know, your body and your mind are so integrated. So I would do, you know, 45 minutes an hour yoga video and then a very long shavasana like just lying there yes. you know it's like meditation lying down um and i think you know i luckily am not living alone i'm with my parents but um i would spend some time with them but if i was living alone just for those of you who are i would go out and take a walk at a park mm. and you know keep six feet away from people but smile and say hi to them um, and I, I would do that anyway, even though I am living with people, I'm going to, that would be part of my day. Um, so going out and getting some connection, but also some sunshine, because that is really important being outside connection with nature. Um, Absolutely. you know, we're not supposed to drive very far, but find the closest place that has a beautiful nature and that can just be a little park. Um, and then I think I would probably, uh, just to be honest, make myself some really good food because I like food. Yes. <laughs> eat it mindfully, you know? Yes. Um, but, <laughs> yeah, that would be part of it. Um, so I think, you know, there's probably, oh, oh, and I would I'd integrate some creativity. Um, and, you know, whether that's a game with my, my family, I tend to yeah. really like interactive games. Um, you know, if anybody's played things or cards against humanity, right? Yes. <laughs> it's raunchy, but it's creative, you know, those kind oh, of yeah. things. Or maybe just spending some time drawing or making music. I mean, for me, no, but my sister has done all these videos that where she'll, you know, make up a song and do a parody or something. Like something creative would yeah. be a for sure. So, um, and, and you know, more good food. 
then that would be, you know, crucial. <laughs> Good food throughout the entire day. That's just right. Like, just circle back to the kitchen, That's right. right? Like in yeah. between each activity, it's just like another delicious thing. That's right. And I like cooking. I see it as a creative thing as well. So it would definitely have to be things that were, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not much of a baker because they tell you exactly what to do. I'm like, no, I want to try this and that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that would be part of it for me. <laughs> I love that. That's amazing. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, wait, wait, before I wrap up, uh, one takeaway, like one thing that if they forget everything else, that sh they, it, what would be your one takeaway that listeners should take? So it's not original because uh, this is a huge part of positive psychology, but one major researcher in positive psychology said if you could sum up the whole field in two words, it would be this, uh, three words rather, other people matter. And I think that that's what I would have you take away from this is that we are told from the time we're born that money, status, and stuff are what matters and then that's what the pursuit of happiness is but the pursuit of happiness is actually connection community service and meaning something greater than yourself and, and i'd say we could add animals and environment into that right because that helps other people and you know some people think animals are people so i would say find something greater than yourself do some service and connect with other people right not just animals connect with other people um, and all of that will allow you to get through this and all of that will allow you to have a meaningful and impactful and satisfactory life. That's what I would say. Other people matter. And mic drop. Wow. <laughs> yes. Sorry. Sorry to ruin your beautiful moment with my- You didn't. You just made it better. <laughs> <laughs> you just made it. I wish I did that. <laughs> Man, it's, that was beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. I love that. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to come and chat with me. And I hope that um, this has been useful to some of you. And oh, oh, I hope that it's useful to all of you. That would be ideal. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you again. Well, thank you for having me. It's been lovely. And this is part of service to other people. So if anybody gets anything out of it, you've just made me happier and yourself. So yay. <laughs> yay. That's the goal, right? Other yeah. people matter. Yep, exactly.